Hey, this is Gary. This is Mike. And Daniel. We're not professionals. We're just three addicts sharing our experiences, strength, and hope regarding recovery. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other addicts and to practice these principles in our lives. Welcome, everyone, to the 12th Step Podcast. This is Daniel. This is Gary. This is Mike. We wanted to do things a little bit different with this episode. We found a wonderful interview with Patrick Parnes. It's someone we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast. And Patrick Carnes was interviewed on the Beyond Theory podcast, and he talks a lot about sex addiction. And because of that, we wanted to share that with you. So here, without further ado, is Patrick Carnes talking about sex addiction. The brain craves challenge, wants to be happy and feel validated and feel like it's in a zone where what they're doing really matters. So once you understand that, the issue is this. Getting sober is not the issue. Staying sober, making a change that lasts is the real critical issue. Technology's purpose is to improve the quality of life for humanity. But unfortunately, in many ways, it has provided unintended consequences. For example, serving as stimuli for sex addiction. Dr. Patrick Karn says that as technologies evolve, we must remain vigilant about the issue, especially when it comes to adolescence. But can vigilance and treatment practices evolve just as rapidly as technology? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. Well, Dr. Patrick Carnes, thank you so much for coming on the Beyond Theory podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here. So uh, I kind of want to just start with a definition here. So if you would just kind of define what sex addiction is and things of that nature. Well, one of the things that we've learned is that whenever sex addiction is paired with a cause, Me Too, uh, sexual abuse, those kinds of things, Immediately, everybody thinks that's what sex addiction is. And the reality is, is that the breadth of things that sex addicts do is quite huge. And um, we have a measure of almost 219 different behaviors that people use, can use addic- addictively. And it can be your pastor, your physician, your, um, your seven-year-old. I mean, I get calls from people who have their 11 or 12 year old and the FBI has arrived to arrest them because they were looking at kids who were the same age that they were. And so the fact is, it's a very broad problem. It's another way to think about it. And that is to think about it as what's happening in addiction in our culture. Kids start off with gaming which teaches the brain certain rules about conquest, novelty, things that appeal to the brain. So then they discover something sexual, and they get what they call the supernormal stimulus. And it actually changes how the brain functions. And so every hour, 600 kids find something on the Internet sexual, they find interesting. 200 of them go on to have a lifetime problem. 85 of them are at the age of 11. So this is not an adult problem. It affects the elderly. It affects lots of people. It has huge consequences that cost our medical system staggering amounts of money. So when people think of the media, what media seizes on, are things that are sensational, that are threatening and what have you, and they think that's sex addiction. In the Me Too movement, the people that were victimizing others 
they have other problems. Right. And Dr. Carnes, you talked about that stimulus, you know, a while. And 10 years ago, you talked about the Internet kind of providing that stimulus. Yes. Uh, as well. And, and at that time, about 10 years ago, Instagram was in, in its infancy. Uh, you didn't have things like Tinder, online dating as much. And right. now you have tech. Uh, I guess I'm just curious about commentary uh, there, because it seemed like you were right on that in seeing what we're seeing now and predicting what we're seeing now. Yeah, well, within the eight, last 18 months. Right. Uh, TikTok has changed everything, even for the porn industry. Now, we're talking about the largest business in the world, cross country, every country is in the, this business. It's all very, it's just, they're all interlocked with one another. They trade, they aggregate, they send people to each other, what have you. But now you have people who can go on a site for free get fans, and suddenly start charging for that. The flow of money within the porn industry, this is a huge amount of money. So if you think about the, what we're up against, think of, first of all, what we went through with tobacco, big tobacco. Think of what, what NFL went through when we started to understand what was happening to our football stars. And with that by the time they were 40, they had brain damage. NFL did not want to hear about that. Think of big food and our struggle with obesity in our culture, which is 30% of our grade, grade school students who got, are already in a problem because there are things in that food that get them to eat things that aren't, that they don't need or want. Then there's big trauma in sex addiction and that whole, that industry is huge. So there are critics out there. Academic critics who are big paid huge sums of money to attack the science that has been around for 20 years. We've understood a lot about the addictive brain. You first have to understand how the brain becomes addicted. And then you have to look at all the places it appears and it appears in more than one. And so the reality is if we look at our culture right now in 2014, we led the world in advances of longevity. People lived longest in America. By 2017, we lost over 10 years of our longevity from 78 or 79 to 68 and a half. Three years. We're the only country that has that problem. And it's a lot about I know I'm not being bite-sized for no, you at the fine. moment. But, you're fine. But, it's all good. But, the, but the reality is, if you look at our culture and our medical cast, I can make it really short for you. We spend more every year than we have on COVID from the beginning. We had 700,000 people so far die of COVID. We have over a million people die every year of addiction-precipitated deaths. But nobody cares. Why? Big food. Big sex. Tobacco. So how do we steer the conversation to get people to care, Dr. Carnes, in your opinion? Like, well, I think one of the ways to do it is for parents to understand what's happening to their kids. We have 6 million kids at any given time between the ages of 12 and 16 that are struggling with this. And one of the things that has been in the scientific literature that we've learned is that students, we have a short um, assessment that professionals can do called pathos. One of the questions is, did you tell anybody that you were having this problem? And the thing about adolescents and college kids is it's the one question none of them answered. They never sought help. And so part of it is educating kids about what happens to the brain, what happens in addiction, what mental health is all about, and doing it in school. Doing it in ways that parents start learning homework. Homework is done on the kitchen table in front of everybody. There's no private laptop in your room. There's not long periods of time where you can access the liquor cabinet and also watch porn. In other words, what I'm saying is that parents need to start understanding what's going on. This isn't about pedophiles. 
It's not about abuse of stars. It's, it's not about sexual assault. Although, if you read, and I know you know Gladwell's book, mm-hmm. you know, Talking to Strangers. Right. And in there, he talks about the way kids are drinking differently. Okay, so if we pick up our story with kids, they start, uh, they get ADHD. That's what the psychiatrist says, because they're not doing their homework. So he puts them on Adderall. Adderall and porn, it's like pouring gasoline on the flame. In school, I wonder what other kinds of things I can find. By the time that they're 18 and they overdose, everybody is suddenly surprised. How did this happen? It's because it's been going on since they were just a little kid. Right. You know, how do we get to that point where we understand that it's not a moral failing and that it, it's neurological? Yes. Because that's a big piece of yes. getting to that point. Well, actually, there is a model for this that works. And you're part of that. What happened in Alberta, which is a province of Canada, they decided to see what they could do to change public attitudes. They put $150 million into educating the healthcare professionals. And then they put a huge amount of money in terms of assessing what the average citizen thought addiction was. And it was what you would guess. You would guess that it was uh, upbringing, uh, moral failure, uh, you know, all the things that are stereotypic kinds of stuff about different peoples and what have you. Then they did an intensive two-year campaign. Every radio station, every TV, every any place they went in a healthcare system, there was information about addictions that they come in lots of different ways, the damage that they do, uh, what problem is a brain, how the brain changes, that kind of information. So they become informed about it as they would any other healthcare issue. Two years later, they did another massive assessment of their citizenship. Clearly, the understanding of addiction dramatically more. Clearly, huge difference. Second, the top three out of all the ones, number one was sexual compulsivity. Second was compulsive working. The third, cocaine. Yeah. I was surprised at the compulsive working one, but I look at our culture and I just think, like, you know, I look at my iPhone. The average adult looks at their iPhone 225 times a day. Everybody talks about the value of virtual contact in the office. But it also means when you get up and have your coffee in the morning, you sit down at your computer, you're already at it. Dr. Carnes, you were just talking about, you know, the working community. And sometimes we see a lot of high achievers who have to go through sex addiction, sexual addiction recovery, uh, you know, CEOs, entrepreneurs, things of that nature. Why is that? Like, why is it a lot of times where that association where people who are those high achievers often kind of delve into that? Well, actually, there's um, some of the greatest contributions have been in research about that. And there was a, a famous psychologist out of Europe by the name of Mahai Csikszentmihalyi, and he wrote a book called Flow which was aimed at the heart of the addiction medicine community. What he said is people of great achievement use their brains the same way addicts do. In other words, they're people, the brain craves challenge, wants to be happy and feel validated and and feel like it's in a zone where what they're doing really matters. And So once you understand that, the issue is this. Getting sober is not the issue. Lots of people got sober many times. Staying sober, making a change that lasts, is the real critical issue. And the way you do that is you move that person into their own excellence and a feeling of achievement. Part of staying in that zone is, first of all, something that's challenging, 
something that you can improve at, something that matters. And suddenly you're feeling happy because of what you're doing. His point to the whole world was 180 studies from many countries pointing the same direction that addiction has. So some of our greatest leaders, Abraham Lincoln was bipolar. Uh, You know, you look at John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Edison, our greatest inventors, what have you. They all, because they had a mind that craved challenge, were also very vulnerable to addictive and mental health issues. And so the attitude has to be that we understand that this is not about moral failings, not that you're a bad person, but what happened to you? Growing up, what happened to you? Because the whole key rests on toxic stress, trauma, and the negativity of being just in the air of pain and fear and uncertainty. I think that's our problem now as a country. In the Total Stranger book, Gladwell talks about the misperceptions we have of each other. And he uses addiction. And if you remember the story in the book, he talks about sexual assault on campus. And the reason is, is that kids are now drinking differently. They don't go to the party to get drunk. They come to the party drunk to get really drunk. And they get what we call myopia or some people use the term blackouts, where they do things they don't remember. That's when sexual assault occurs. And there's a lot of our people who are caught in things that they can't stop and they don't know how. So mental health in our culture is not valued and therapy is not seen as a way out. The single biggest unreported crime in America is domestic violence. And people caught up in the trauma of that. With that is a whole family of diseases, of personality disorders. And we need to see the medical condition that mental health presents to us. Brain has changed. It's got a problem now. Doesn't know how to stop. Doesn't know how to walk away from a partner that baits you into a fight. Don't know how to do that. And that actually brings me to a different part of this conversation I wanted to get to, because a lot of times it doesn't just affect the person who's in recovery. It's affecting family members. Uh, You know, you know, I I would love for you to talk about if I'm a family member, I'm a spouse and I'm seeing these things, you know, how do I go about doing that? Do I address the person head on? Do I ask somebody for help? If you would just kind of share that strategy. Well, let's back up for a minute. Okay. You asked a loaded question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you did it on purpose. The reality is there's kind of a um, an algorithm for every addict or mental health problem. There's three other people that are intimately affected by it. If you start adding them up, all the alcoholics, all the substance abuse users, The two reasons that college students drop out of school is prescription drugs and sex addiction. They're spending more time on porn than going to class. So the reality is, and and what we're seeing in women now getting involved with the porn industry, and, and, and the most recent change within the porn industry is women users. Uh, on both sides. And so what what we're talking about is if you add in then the obesity issue, you add in the gambling issue, which is a huge problem for a lot of people, money and the kind of the seductiveness of the win that changes my life and makes everything okay. Sex addiction, you add them all up. That's why we spent four times the cost of COVID every year. It's because there's so many of them. 
Now add three people to every one of those. You're talking most of this country. And one of the effects of that is the ability of the brain to put yourself in the other person's shoes of what it feels like to be them. We've lost that. That sense of what their experience is. And that's why Gladwell was talking about the violence issues. Same thing happened in Germany. Germany was a nation of addicts. Crystal meth was everywhere. Every soldier was given crystal meth. Pilots, sailors, housewives, everybody was using it, which is why you could live next to a concentration camp and not care. And the thing that is important about that is we becoming a country, our compassion scores have declined steadily for 20 years. Again, the only nation that has that problem. I definitely understand that, you know, but I would also imagine that we've come a lot of, you know, forward a lot of ways in different avenues in attacking this way. You talked er a while back about how um, that in the 90s with the Clinton Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky scandal that, you know, it was a bit taboo to kind of talk about these things. And so, you know, after that, you know, we started to empathize just a little bit more and start to head in that the right direction. Uh, you know, do you see more of that happening in the future? I mean, I know we just talked about that negative part, but there are other parts on the other side of that, correct, Dr. Carr? Do you mean that that our understanding has grown? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think that it has. However, I think also it is the nature of addiction and the nature of trauma to affect literally people's denial of the situation that they're in. The average spouse has to be beaten 35 times before she tells anybody. So what's happening is the nature of these things that we're talking about is people stay stuck. And unless the whole culture, if you were a, a diabetic and your doctor told you you needed insulin, you take it because you have to live. If you were bipolar, this medicine will help you. If you take it, you'll have a no, normal, long life that we was rewarding. In the things we're talking about, there's a way to work with that, but there's resistance to understanding that it's a medical problem. And, doc, and the physicians have been talking about this for a long time. Like the uh, ASAM, American Society for Addiction Medicine, has been talking over three decades about this problem. You know, it's funny you mentioned that we talked to Erica Tresino a while back uh, from the Meadows Ranch, and she talked about how uh, eating disorders is kind of a, you know, an issue to kind of get people to see that it's an actual disorder. And it seems like same thing here. Yeah. You know, uh, so I appreciate you sharing that. I want to go back to something a little bit, kind of transition here, uh, because I know when you uh, wrote your book, Out of the Shadows, yes. that this was a time where, you know, you got criticized a little bit from time to time about, you know, uh, your research and your findings. I'm curious because we have clinicians who watch Beyond Theory. Uh, you know, talk about that resolve and that, that, um, that fortitude to move forward when you know what you're researching and, and describing is helping people, but you're still getting criticism. It's one of the binds I think mental health is in because you see the pain of your patients and then you hear a stand up comic talk about sex addiction isn't real. It's just the guys who got caught and audience laughs. In other words, one of the things that is not taken seriously is because the people who see the problem, no disease entity ever got what it needed until the people who had the problem stood up and spoke out. And similarly, they're caregivers. Until that happens, where you have people speaking out, then that is happening. More and more people are standing up and saying, you know, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a sex addict, what have you. That is happening. The other part is what academics do, because that's kind of how they're trained to think, they talk about it as a model. 
It's not a model. It's a medical condition. If you look at what the patient is actually experiencing and you look at a brain scan and you can see the brain damage, we have now got a medical problem. This brain is now at a place where it cannot on its own stop. And that's the issue is because they're destroying themselves. They're destroying themselves. It's on a plane to Atlanta. Guy sitting next to me is going to Atlanta. Movie producer. Wants to shoot crash scenes. I love cars, so I wanted to hear how he did. And after about four or five minutes, I said, you got to be in recovery. I said, how did you know? He says, I, I said, I don't know. Just the words you use, the way you show up, the way you talk, you're present, what have you. And it's like uh, your clarity about yourself with me. And he says, well, I've been in AA for four years. And he said, but the problem I'm having is, he says, do you know anything about sex addiction? And I said, well, I know a little bit. been in the program since 1977. And he says, well, I got three sponsees. And they have enough sexual energy to light up a third world country. The fact of the matter is, they're doing dangerous things that they know are self-destructive. They're not listening to their therapist, their sponsor, to their friends, and they keep doing it anyway. They're going to be dead. But I can't get them to stop. So I had to say, I, I, I can't watch this. Until this culture gets to the point where they're tired of the way that we are living right now, or the things that are dividing us are all things that can be dealt with. It's about our collective will to say, I won't watch this. No longer will I watch this. Absolutely. Dr. Carnes, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've done a lot in this industry, you know, sharing your research, the work that you've done. If I were to just ask you, what do you think your legacy would be? What do you think? You know, I, I, I think about that. I'm 77. So I do think about that. My kids are in good shape. I've done my job as a member of the species. They're all upright and growing families, earning their own money done my job and that counts in terms of what I've done is I think I've written some durable books that have lasted a long time I mean we'll up, we update them and what have you but that's been a contribution there's an interesting thing that happens to people who have achievements Almost all the great discoveries were made by somebody outside of the field that that discovery was absolutely central to. I mean, if you go through science, most of the people who discovered things were people who were not trained in that particular thing. And I think that was true for me. I was dragged kicking and screaming into the addiction medicine field. And sex, the sexuality field, same thing. Not popular, but I saw it with a different set of eyes. And I think that the issue of people standing up and speaking out their truth, I think I did that for myself. But right or wrong. I know what I saw. I saw people who were really hurting, and I saw them get better and live richer lives. And that's what I described. And I spoke to my own experience. And until I think that happens for more of us, you know, I think that's the problem. In Germany in 1934, there was a pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he saw what was happening to the Jews. 
and he preached a sermon in which he said, this is wrong. This is not a spiritual thing to do. This has racism attached to it. And Hitler hated him, punished him, eventually threw him in a concentration camp. And Hitler hated him so much that he weighed to the day before he suicided to order Bonhoeffer's death. And Bonhoeffer wrote in his book a concept called Cheap Grace. And that's when in religion you go through the motions to look like you're a good religious person. That's cheap grace, or cost and loss. Doesn't cost you anything. The real human being is the one who speaks their truth, even though people aren't going to like it. That's the, that's the edge of truth, which is a difficult place to occupy. We have to get more honest with each other and live on the edge of truth. This is the 12th Step Podcast. This is Gary mm -hmm. saying, do the next right thing. And this is Mike saying, find the peace that recovery can bring. Do the work. Do mm -hmm. the work to find the peace that recovery can bring. And this is Daniel uh, saying, find the humility in your recovery and take that first step. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like this episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find us. As a fellowship of recovering addicts, Sex Addicts Anonymous offers a message of hope to anyone who suffers from sex addiction. Check out saa-recovery.org.